The next item of business is topical questions, and at question number one, I call Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to reports that Circularity Scotland expects to make £57 million a year by the public failing to return containers, and that this is part of the company's business model. Minister Lorna Slater. Circularity Scotland is a not-for-profit company established by industry and made up of producers, retailers, hospitality wholesalers and trade associations. Everyone who pays a deposit on a drinks container will be able to reclaim that deposit in full. Any unredeemed deposits from Scotland's deposit return scheme will be reinvested into keeping the costs of running the scheme as low as possible for producers of all sizes across Scotland. This model is in line with the best practice seen in other schemes around the world. Under the DRS regulations, the scheme administrator is required to meet a minimum of 80% return rates in the first year and 90% in subsequent years. Failure to meet these targets would result in financial penalties, establishing a very strong incentive for Circularity Scotland to ensure high return rates. Brian Whittle. I thank the Minister for that answer, but the Scottish Government's own full business case for the scheme states explicitly, explicitly that unredeemed deposits are anticipated to make up between 32 per cent and 43 per cent of Circularity Scotland's revenue. It goes to, on to say that modelling assumes that the 90 per cent capture rate of containers is achieved by year three of the scheme's operating and it is maintained for the remainder of the 25 years. That seems pretty clear. The higher the capture rate, the lower the revenue for Circularity Scotland. Surely the Minister accepts that this creates a perverse incentive for Circularity Scotland to avoid increasing the capture rate. Minister. Uh, the member is, is uh, a little bit out of date on what he said. When the dates were moved forward for the launch of the scheme, the dates for the recycling targets were not changed. So the recycling target is 80% in the first year and 90% in the subsequent years of that scheme. The successful deposit return schemes off the, around the world are based on this principle of producer responsibility, and they are funded in three ways. One is through the producer fees, the secondly is through the value of the materials gathered by the scheme, and the third is from the unredeemed deposits. Uh, this is true as well for the UK government scheme. In the UK government's own consultation published in January on their depository scheme that they intend to bring in England and Wales and Northern Ireland, they have said, and I quote, where a container is not returned, the value of deposit on that container will be held by the DMO, that's their word for the administrator. This is an unredeemed deposit and is potentially of significant value stream for the DMO, helping to fund the operation of the scheme. And Thank this you, is Minister. a common funding stream found in many international DRSs. Thank you. Brian Whittle. Of course, even if Circularity Scotland were to increase the capture rate, we don't know how, how such a loss of revenue might affect them because the Scottish Government has, in their seemingly endless quest to muddy the waters around the scheme, shrouded Scotland's DRS administrator in secrecy, creating a private company immune to freedom of information and, despite being producer-led, as the Minister is so fond of saying, is utterly unwilling to tell producers signing up to the scheme what potential liabilities they are accepting responsibility for, including the terms of the contract with Biffa. Will the Minister see sense, pause this opaque, badly designed, potentially disastrous mess of a deposit return scheme now, or does she remain determined to leave us guessing all about whether it will even reach launch, given it will, be dep it will depend on who wins the SNP leaders' election? Thank you, Mr. How Whittle. are business supposed to uh, plan a way ahead in that environment of uncertainty? Minister. Uh as passed by this Parliament, the regulations call for this to be an industry-led scheme. And Circularity Scotland is the not-for-profit com company established by industry. And I have a list here of the members of CSL, which include trade associations, the Scottish uh, Society of Independent Brewers, Scottish Soft Drinks Association, Wine and Sp Spirit uh, Trade Association, and, and many more. Uh, Diageo, Coca-Cola, Heineken, Sainsbury's, uh, Marks & Spencer, Little, and so on. These are the members of CSL. This is who CSL has created CSL and they are responsible for making sure that it works for them. CSL is a private, not-for-profit company whose responsibility is to help businesses in Scotland comply with the regulations as passed by this Parliament. And they are working towards, and have reassured me, that they are working towards a go-live date of the 16th of August as agreed by this Parliament. Thank you. There's much interest, as you would expect, in this entire session, and I'd be grateful for concise questions and responses. Fergus Ewing. Thank you, <coughs> Presiding Officer. Um, 
Much, if not most, of the £57 million, uh, which will be lost in non-redeemed, non-claimed deposits, will be paid out and lost by those who can't or can't readily return bulky and heavy items, bottles, tins and cans. And these will predominantly include the poorest, those without a car, the elderly, mobility impaired, and rural and island dwellers who can't access the return point. Uh, their money will go, Presiding Officer, to the non-disclosed but probably telephone number salaries of the bosses of Circularity Scotland. Is this transfer of money, Minister, from the poorest to the richest not simply immoral? Minister. I think the mis member mischaracterises the scheme entirely. The, every person in Scotland will pay the 20 pence deposit when they buy a drink in Scotland, when they buy a, container, a drink in the containers that are scheme articles, and they will get their 20 pence back when they return those articles. Accessibility to the scheme is critical Sweet, to the success the of the scheme, and we are working hard with Circularity Scotland and BIFA to ensure that every person in Scotland will be able to access the scheme and will be able to get their deposits back. Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. Accessibility is important, and the Government took a decision recently to exempt small retailers from the online take-back scheme. Could the Minister explain, therefore, how people who are housebound, disabled, for example, are going to have their bottles taken back um, if they have taken them for online from a small retailer? Because there is a real accessibility challenge there for those people. Minister. Uh, thanks. On, on the two points there, uh, nobody is required to take the uh, scheme article back to the exact store that they bought it from. So even if you buy it for online from a small retailer, you can return it anywhere. But the uh, member makes a good point about people who are not physically able to get to a return point. So with the, change, with the proposed change to the regulation where we are phasing in the online take back, it is of course important that everybody in Scotland, including those uh, who have accessibility and, and mobility issues, be able to access the scheme. And that work is underway to understand how many people that is and how we may best ensure that they can fully access the scheme. Ross Greer. Thank you. Even the Conservatives at Westminster understand that unredeemed deposits should be used to help cover the cost of this scheme and thus reduce costs for all, as is normal for equivalent schemes across the continent. Perhaps the real reason that the Scottish Tories and their colleague Fergus Ewing seem so desperate to bring the DRS into disrepute is because they object to the fundamental principle of the scheme that the polluter pays instead of the taxpayer. So could I ask the Minister if she could share with Parliament the cost to local councils every year of litter caused by drinks containers and therefore how much this alone will save the taxpayer. Uh, Minister. Ab absolutely. Uh, six, uh, so £46 million pounds a year of public money is spent every year removing litter and fly tipping from the Scottish environment. Deposit return scheme will mean that local authorities will have less waste to handle, as well as reducing litter and associated clean-up costs. This is good for residents and council budgets. Kat Jones, the director of the Association for the Protection of Rural Scotland, supports removing these costs from the taxpayer. She, uh, she says, and I quote, for too long, the costs of single-use cans and bottles have been met by local taxpayers, communities, and our environment. It is high time that industry took responsibility for the waste they create, just as they do around the world. Thank you. Question number two, Beatrice Wishart. To ask the Scottish Government how many children and young people it estimates have not taken up the free bus pass. Minister Jenny Gilruth. At the end of February, there were over 590,000 cardholders in the Young Persons Free Bus Travel Scheme, equating to 63.5% of the estimated 930,000 eligible population. That means approximately 340,000 children and young people have not yet joined the scheme. However, uptake of the scheme is as high as 73% amongst 12 to 15 year olds and 75% amongst 16 to 21 year olds who can use it more independently. Those already accessing the scheme continue to make good use of free bus travel with over over 50 million journeys made since the scheme launched in January of last year. Beatrice Wishart. Parliamentary questions answered by the Transport Minister show that despite over a million pounds being spent on a PR campaign, hundreds of thousands of young people are still missing out on their free bus pass entitlement. Not only is getting a free under-22 bus pass needlessly complicated, many of Scotland's rural areas lack reliable and frequent bus services. Bus passes save young people money with free journeys to education and work, but the SNP Green Government can't give them away in the middle of a cost of living crisis. Why hasn't the campaign been more effective and what lessons have been learnt from it? And does the Minister think it's anything to do with cuts to bus services by networks across the country? Minister. I think the 
member for her question. I'd like to remind the member that when I was first appointed in January of last year, of course, we were still dealing with the impacts of the Omicron variant of COVID. That delayed, of course, the rollout of the marketing campaign. She will understand that that was inhibiting people's usual travel behaviour at the time. I think that was the right decision. The second point I would make to the member is there were a number of challenges with the application form at the start of last year in relation to the process as she has outlined. I worked with the Improvement Service, who, of course, ministers tasked with the delivery of the scheme to improve the application process to make it easier for young people to apply. And I think that was fundamentally important. Now, the member made reference to the marketing campaign, of course, which came into effect later in the year. The campaign was actually really effective. It managed to reach over 97% of the adult population in Scotland. They would have seen or heard the campaign at least three times and over 94% of 13 to 18 year olds. The campaign also had a really positive impact on people taking action, with 79% of people who had seen or heard the campaign claiming they'd taken action as a result. So I think the evaluation overall shows the impact of the marketing campaign on the under 22s to have been a successful one. And I hope the member will uh, support the continued successful rollout of the scheme to her constituents. Beatrice Wishart. Young people can travel from home fr to, from, uh, home from university or anywhere in the Scottish mainland for free using their, bus on, uh, their pass on any bus. Why then can't the passes be used for our young people travelling home via ferry or inter-island ferries where ferries are used like buses? If there are passes going unused, why can't the provision be extended to ferries and those young people crying out for this change? Minister. I thank the member for her question. She has repeatedly raised the point with me, and I am sympathetic to the point. Um, I remind the member, of course, that when the uh, under-22 scheme came into effect, we did carry out an island's community's impact assessment that concluded that ferry travel should not be included in the scheme, but the issues related to ferry fares should be considered as part of the island's connectivity plan and our wider fare fares review. So I am sympathetic to the point the member has made. I think in our previous meeting earlier this year, actually, um, I alluded to the member that it would be included as part of the government's fair fares review that will publish later this year. And I very much recognise the dependency that her constituents will have in relation to ferry services as opposed to bus services, given her constituency. There are many members wishing to ask questions. I'd be grateful if we could pick up the pace. Bob Doris. So I would commend Glasgow Life who recognise the ART card, the application registration card, to address barriers faced by refugees and asylum seekers under 22 who have struggled to provide age ID evidence to secure a national entitlement card for free bus travel. However, the Red Cross informed me that some local authorities do not accept the ART card and it is not listed on national nor local guidance. Can I ask the Minister to look at this matter to ensure guidance is updated and best practices shared across Scotland? And will she look more widely at lengthy waits, often several months, for paper applications to be processed? Minister. I thank the member for this question. Um, there is guidance available for local councils advising of proof specific to asylum seekers and, and refugees uh, for the ARC, as he has alluded to, that has been issued by the Home Office. That can be used to apply for the NEC in person, of course, or in conjunction with other information or evidence that might be available to a council, a school or a dedicated staff member within a council. Um, the ARC is not accepted for online applications as part of the UK Proof of Age Pass. It can't be used to establish evidence of identification online, and so there is not an online equivalent to help give that offline uh, to support applications, as it were. Now, my officials in Transport Scotland are not aware of any delays in relation to the application processing, but if um, the member is able to provide that evidence, I'd be more than happy to raise that directly with Glasgow Life. It's also worth pointing out that the government is supporting a short-term pilot uh, led by the Refugee Survival Trust and Third Sector Partners, which commenced at the end of January this Thank you. Year. We absolutely must have quicker, shorter, I should say, uh, questions and responses. Megan Gallagher. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Local councils have had to cut subsidies for bus travel because of the SNP, Scottish Government's woeful local government settlement. The fact of the matter is that the availability of decent public transport outside of the major cities is unreliable and infrequent, particularly across the central region. So can the Minister explain how this policy can be deemed a success if there's a lack of bus services yeah. for our young people to enjoy? Minister. I thank the member for her question. Um, I think it's worth pointing out that as a government, we invest over £300 million annually to deliver free bus travel for all children and young people under 22, as well as for eligible disabled people and everyone aged oh, 60 or over. That means, of course, that Scotland has the most generous concessionary fare scheme in the UK, with more than 2 million people eligible for free bus travel, encouraging more people, of course, to take the bus and move away from taking the car, which is hugely important in, re in relation to reaching our net zero targets. And additionally, we've also been able to award over £25 million pounds of funding in relation to the Bus Partnership Fund. I, I might have thought Megan Gallagher would have welcomed that additionality in terms of the funding provided by this government. Neil Bibby. 
The Scottish Government statistics released today show that the number of buses in service in Scotland has plummeted under the SNP from 5,400 in 2007 to just 3,700. Passenger number journeys have been halved over the same period. Young people are asking the same question that older people have been asking. What's the point in a free bus pass if there's no bus to use it on? With even more service cuts set to happen in the next few weeks, what is the Minister going to do to fix Scotland's broken bus market? Minister. I thank the member for his question. I think the member needs to reflect, as a Labour MSP, that the bus sector continues to face a number of challenges presented, of course, by Brexit in relation to staffing challenges and staffing shortages, but also in relation to fuel costs. Now, many of those matters, as he will know, are reserved to the UK Government. I discussed them at length with the bus task force, which I convened uh, just a couple of weeks ago now, and the sector are hugely challenged by the, the challenges presented by those uh, issues. Well, Brexit, uh, I hear the member... Excuse me, Minister, can position. I just ask that there are no interruptions yeah, when ministers right. are responding and when members are asking questions? I'm sure we would each wish to be treated courteously and respectfully. Minister. I, I continue to hear the, the member yeah. chuntering away from a sedentary position, presiding officer, but I will continue. I think it is important to highlight the additional support this government provides for uh, the widest concessionary travel scheme in the UK. Over two million people in Scotland can travel for free, and the importance of that cannot be underlined enough, because given yesterday we managed to hit the 50 million targets uh, for the number of journeys that have been taken by the under-22 scheme, but also in relation to tackling poverty. Another point I thought a Labour member might have been interested in, Child Poverty Action Group have now managed to assess that children and young people in Scotland are saving on average £3,000 in a lifetime compared to their counterparts elsewhere in the UK because of the investment this government is putting into concessionary travel. Question number three, Alec Crowley. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government, in light of the EIS vote to accept the latest pay offer, what assessment has been undertaken to understand the impact of days lost as a result of industrial action on children's education and the school environment? Cabinet Secretary Shirley Ann Somerville. The modifications to courses already in place this year will help to mitigate some of the impact of the industrial action. In addition, prior to the industrial action, the SQA has confirmed that a sensitive and evidence-based approach to grading is planned this year. A wide range of study support is available through the national e-learning offer, including live interactive Easter support webinars for the senior phase that will run from the 3rd to the 14th of April. And local authorities and schools themselves will continue to monitor the impact that industrial action has had on learners and whether or not any additional action is needed at a local level. Alec Crowley. I thank the Minister for that answer. I would say that teachers, parents, children are absolutely delighted that we have eventually got to a conclusion and that is welcome in terms of the dispute. But over these last months, I have talked to many teachers in, on picket lines and in arranged meetings, and I have become quite alarmed at the, the concerns that teachers are raising around the decline in discipline in schools, decline in behaviour in schools, and indeed levels of violence that are increasing. Teachers say that post-COVID that issue has become greater and greater. Does the Cabinet Secretary recognise those concerns? And if so, what does the government do to try and support teachers and frontline schools? Cabinet Secretary. Well, Mr Rowley, it does raise uh, a very important um, point. And uh, during my biannual discussions that I'm holding with unions um, last week and this week, this is one of the, the areas that is on the agenda. I've already um, recently had um, another discussion with the teachers panel um, about what we can do on this issue. One of the examples of that is the review of the national guidance um, on this to see where national government can make changes uh, to support uh, teachers and uh, support staff. So this is an issue that the government takes very seriously. That's why that review is being undertaken. That's why research is currently being undertaken at this point and why Education Scotland also just completed a thematic review uh, also of the uh, reporting of incidents um, of bullying within our schools. Alec Crowley. I thank you and I welcome what the Cabinet Secretary had to say. Can I say, though, that I wrote to Fife, the Director of Education in Fife last week, basically raising these same issues and my concerns. She replied by saying they are experiencing, like, like, like across Scotland, increased mental health problems, the impact of poverty, the impact of trauma and the impact of the pandemic all having an impact on frontline schools. 
She went on to say that a model of having social workers based in school in secondary schools is about to be piloted in four secondary schools. Also, that we now have police presence in six schools playing a frontline role. So from all that and from the actions that Fife's taken, what you can see is that there is a massive pressure on our, our schools on education and there needs to be some kind of, I believe, coordinated support and resources going in for these types of actions. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree and is that something that she's going to continue to talk to education authorities about? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I welcome the work that Fife Council is undertaking, as indeed uh, I do with um, every council, uh, who are looking very carefully at this um, uh, issue. Uh, the solution will be different in different schools um, and in local authorities, but uh, the member quite rightly points to what we can do um, at a national level to support them. I would point to, for example, um, the presence of counsellors within our schools, within secondary schools, um, that we work with local government um, to fund, and also, of course, the increased investment in CAMS. The issue around uh, social workers, uh, community development workers, and so on, is also something which we see um, a wide variety of uses with the pupil equity funding, for example, to try and support where there is um, a challenge around attainment um, or attendance um, at school as well as behaviour. So very, uh, very welcome, very much welcome the work that Five Councils undertaken and very keen to continue my dialogue with them. Stephen Kerr. If I might quote a teacher, behaviour is arguably the most concerning issue for classroom teachers in 2023. The rise in violent, aggressive and criminal behaviour along with the relentless spread of low-level behaviours, is undoubtedly the most mentally taxing and serious issues in education. That's from a teacher. So as teachers return to the classroom after the pay dispute, this is not untypical of how they view the classroom environment. And we've all heard this from teachers, all of us. In no other public-facing line of work is vicious abuse tolerated. Why should teaching be any different? How long before we see more industrial action as government fails to act. This is serious and requires a serious response from the Cabinet Secretary. Who in the Scottish Government is speaking to frontline teachers? Is she speaking to and listening to frontline teachers herself? When will there be practical help? Cabinet Secretary. Well I'm not sure, presiding officer, if Mr Kerr was listening to the answer that I gave earlier. Yeah. I just said I spoke to the teachers panel, which is made up of frontline teachers. Mm -hmm. I met with unions last week, which are representatives of frontline teachers, and will continue those meetings this week, and will be discussing this very issue. Now, I would point out one of the aspects which the teachers panel were keen to feed back to me was that the violent incidents that we see are exceptionally rare. One is one too many, but they are exceptionally rare. And violence, bullying, intimidation of staff or of pupils is not tolerated within our schools, either by this government or any local authority. So we are taking very seriously uh, this issue. I went in further detail uh, to Mr Rowley and to some of the aspects um, that we are doing, uh, because I do recognise that this is uh, a concern of both teachers, uh, pupils um, and their parents, and we will continue to work with frontline teachers to support them. 